which are <coughs> contributing to their reading difficulties. Now, sometimes if a kid is young enough, a good way to teach a kid to read, if they're like four or five or six, well actually it's good practice to do with every kid based on the research, is play these kinds of games with three-year-olds or four-year-olds and just play these very kinds. There's, uh, there's actually you know, materials that have activities for teaching these to young kids. You just play these games as part of the instruction. I don't know, does anyone teach preschool? Or, well, I think it'd be good to have activities like this in preschool because it kind of sets the stage so that when you introduce letters, then they say, oh yeah, I see. I see how this works. You know, it makes more sense because they've been playing these games about sounds within words and sound sequencing. So this are this should be a good this should be a part of a preschool is teaching playing phonological games. So if you were if you're testing students for this and you have like I have a phonological assessment for K through second grade, but if I have concerns for a fourth grade student um, and I use the tasks I developed for K through second, which are those tasks but with simpler words, is that should I be looking for a different assessment for older? Well, the, I have to say that this one test I use that has these kinds of tasks, um, yeah, here's other kinds of things you can do, uh, measure. Um, what test is it you use? You I use a comprehensive test of phonological processing. I mean, who, who puts it out? Did you put it together or who no. designed it? No, I'm just trying to think of the box and what's on the box. Um, um, it's the, um, uh, well, I know it might be, it might be psych, assess psych Assessment Resources, PAR. You've seen that catalog before? Psych, psych Assessment Resources? Yeah, Psych Assessment Resources. I think they're the ones who sell it. But it's Comprehensive Test of Phonological Processing, and I was getting ready to tell you, it goes all the way up to age 24. Now, some of these tests, you know, if you're still having problems at age 24 with uh, these kinds of tasks, it shows you that, well, you know, this, this explains why. But I don't know if you would go back then and start playing baby games with them, you know. You'd probably use some other approach to teach them reading. But that, that test is for people of all, you know. All it's not changed for different ages. Uh, yeah, there's certain subtests you use for uh, four to six, but then from six on, it's all the same subtests. So I have two assessments, one for lower grades, one for higher grades, and I'm just wondering. Yeah, well this, this test is, is considered to be appropriate for mm -hmm. all school age people and even young adults, so okay. I've, I've used it sometimes with adults. And, uh, Usually what I find is that they do fine except on the rapid naming part. They're still slow. And if, if you read in, um, wait, yeah, the rapid naming parts where they have to just read numbers and letters, that's what I find with adults. And if you read in Sally Shaywitz's book, that's usually the sequel of what happens to adults, or college students even, who have reading disorders, is that they start out, they get help, they start to learn the, the rules, they can spell better, they can read with fewer errors, and they, or they can read pretty accurately, but they often continue to read slowly. So that's the last. Spelling and reading fluency are the two areas that often are really the last to kick in or resolve. So I think that even the chapter, there's a chapter that says testing the young adult or in that book. and. Um, or assessing the young adult, but they they show that the fluency is always the last thing to happen. See, I'll see. I will reassess kids who are 18 and they're going to college, and their reading skills look fine, except their reading rate is still slow. And so, you know, I make the argument: this is the way uh, dyslexia plays out: is that you start to acquire those skills, but you're still slow at applying rules and recognizing words and just tracking fluently. And it's kind of a hard argument to make, but that's really the way it, it plays out. Yeah. 
Do you, do you do you know anything about the minimal instructional reading level required for uh, adult functional reading, like filling out applications, reading the one ads? Do you do you know anything about what that would be? No, I I, I mean we do have a. a they may be knowledgeable about that in our our transition program we have here, but I don't usually. Uh, I've heard sixth sixth or seventh grade, but who knows? Is the level that's considered adequate for doing those things? Yeah. But anyway, so uh, yeah, just to let you know that the phonological. Keep in mind, no single test determines a diagnosis of dyslexia. And of course, you want to make sure hearing and vision issues have been checked out. Yeah? Um, I'm a parent, and uh, my child is in, has an IEP, and she's in third grade. Um, do they go through dyslexia? I mean, figuring out if testing for that, um, if it, she has like a learning you know, they, just to figure out where she's going wrong. Is that like a standard that people would try to test for that? Or mm -hmm. do you have to re require, you know, ask for it or something? Well now, is your, is your child in public school? Um, well, she, no, she's in private school, but she um, actually gets help from the public school for that district that they, they take her from the private school to the public school. And so all the testing is done at the public school, and then it's given back to her teachers in the private school. Mm -hmm. So they share information with the private school teachers, too? Yep, the meetings and stuff, yeah. Well, every school does it different. In a public school, you know, mm -hmm. I'm sure that the teacher, it, it would come down to the individual teacher. And that's where you would want to find out, you know, what they're doing, if, if they're working on specific skills or specific sub-skills, like, certain sounds or certain uh, blending sounds or sight word recognition. I guess you'd want to find that out. And as far as exploring the underlying problem, it's probably been based on, you know, achievement testing. Woodcock Johnson, reading nonsense words, reading actual words. That, that's probably how she was found to be eligible. Right, right. But as far as going and exploring some of the underlying causes, probably not so much. They just go ahead and start addressing the skill weaknesses that they see. Right, right, right. Yeah. Can I say something from my experience? I'm a reading specialist in a private school, and our kids get special ed with the public school, which is right across the, the parking lot. I feel, I feel badly. Um, I cannot. I know um, when a child has dyslexia. I can tell. I have many assessments to give, and I know, but I cannot say that because of liability. Uh, I did come out and say it one time, and I got in a lot of trouble. Um, so I'm, I direct people to private consultants. Some have come here for testing for that, um, because it's really a dilemma. But you know, it, it, it and they will not, they will not say this child is dyslexic. Our, our public school system, there's a special ed department, and people who do the assessments, they will not say that. They will say different little things, but they won't do that. And it all has to do with liability. Yeah, it's like there's a mystique about the word. It's like a dangerous word or I something. Know. Like and, well, and really, so many have dyslexic, dyslexia or dyslexic tendencies. Part, so. And part of the issue is there's a, a huge controversy about how to address dyslexia. And the Orton Gillingham people who have given a lot, you know, to the uh, to education in general. I mean, I'm not I'm not trying to take anything away from them, but sometimes it's a bit myopic in terms of this is the only way to address it, and that has gotten all the way up to the Supreme Court. I mean, it's gone to the court system again and again, and when they look at the research, Orton going in is not the only way to address it. What is another way? It's not a form, uh, phonetic-based form of multi-sensory instruction. What is another way? There's so many Art and Gillingham pro programs, yeah. um, and they're research-based to be successful with dyslexia. Yeah, yeah you have to define what research-based means, is because a lot of these research studies that the Art and Gillingham people will cite are fairly—it's flawed research, basically. In what way? I could. 
I can talk to you about that after. No, but I want to know what other forms of instruction, um, I mean, obviously you can't just do straight work in Gillingham because it's, it's very dry. And I, I think it's difficult for children to focus on that for a real extended period of time. You can incorporate comprehension, vocabulary, and that kind of thing. But it's well, it's true, phonetic based, because that is the diagnosis. And I, I, I can tell you as a special ed teacher who, who has worked with dyslexic students that I've seen significant progress in not doing phonics based instruction. Do